Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Dirk Bosmans. I am communication manager of um, ISFE, the Interactive Software Federation of Europe. And I'll be um, chairing this afternoon's session, which is uh, titled, Where We've Been and Where We Are Going, which sort of sounds like the memoirs of a satnav. And I'll try to be that satnav for you this afternoon. Now, um, the Interactive Software Federation of Europe is the European Federation of um, the national trade associations like ELSPA in the UK and uh, publishing members like Electronic Arts, Nintendo, Microsoft, Sega, you name them. Um, part of, or the largest part of the work that I do in Brussels is based around the PEGI H rating system, um, which I hope you all know. And um, timing was actually perfect because uh, only recently, I think, yesterday or a couple of days ago, uh, Tanya Byron uh, published her progress report uh, to the British government. And in that, she actually gave us a pat on the back, saying that excellent progress was being made uh, with regards to the H rating system, the clarification of the system, and um, the adherence to um, advertisement codes. So I'm going to look straight into the camera and say, Tanya, thank you very much. Um, because uh, her second point was a recommendation to the industry and um, in a larger uh, perspective, also the government and all the other um, institutions in the UK that are involved in the protection of minors, uh, what her recommendation was that it now should be widely publicized, that there should be uh, lots of communication about this. Being the communication manager of ISFE, I'll, um, I'll work on it. I'll promise it, Tanya. Um, now, another part of the work that we did at ISFE is the project called Games in Schools, which is a research project that we commissioned um, with European Schoolnet. It was done in the last two years. Last year, we got the reports in. And basically, it is an um, academic uh, study on the use of commercial games in uh, classroom environments. Um, we published a big academic report based on that, an executive summary, and uh, probably very interesting for some people to know is also a practical handbook for teachers uh, in which they can find checklists and tips and everything they need to know if they are thinking about integrating a, an existing commercial game in their curriculum. Um, now, that actually brings me to the first speaker of today. Um, going back to the satnav uh, metaphor, I think uh, to get this afternoon session started, we should all get a tiger in a tank. So I'd like to invite uh, Richard Wilson, the CEO of uh, Tiger, to the stage. Ladies and gentlemen, it's very nice of you to give me a round of applause. Uh, I understand that uh, if you get a round of applause at the beginning of a speech, it's an act of faith. Uh, if you get a round of applause during a speech, uh, it's an act of hope. And if you get a round of applause at the end of your speech, it's an act of charity. So I hope that my, the faith that you expressed to me will be realized this afternoon. Now, one of the lovely things about life is that opposites often attract. Why is it, on the one hand, that grandparents get on so well with grandchildren? They're united by a common enemy. And similarly in life, if you look at politics, you often find that sometimes people who are on different frames of the political spectrum can sometimes get on tolerably well. So for example, Kenneth Clark, the conservative business spokesman, gets on tolerably well with Peter Mandelson, his counterpart. One of the reasons for this, I think, is that they both agree that we need more real engineering in the economy and less financial engineering. I think Peter Mandelson said that. And Kenneth Clark was very sympathetic to that approach. I think the recession has highlighted several things. I think the first thing is that it has highlighted that the UK economy became far too dependent upon financial services. At the height of the boom, something like 25% of corporation tax was being generated through financial services. At the same time, over the last 10 years, and this has been realized or brought into sharp focus by the recession, We've seen that a lot of exporting jobs, a lot of manufacturing jobs have been lost to the UK economy. So for example, over the last 10 years, 
there's been a 70% fall in the proportion of people who work to create electrical products in the UK economy. But conversely, there's been a 102% increase in the number of people who work as theme park attendants. There's been a dramatic increase, 67%, in the number of psychiatrists who work in the UK economy. And a 63% increase in the proportion of people in the UK today who work as beauticians over the last 10 years. None of these roles are bad. Many of them perform very useful activities. But the fact remains, and this leads into the third point, the fact remains that the UK economy in the future needs to be based on high-tech skills. It needs to reorient itself away from an over-dependence upon financial services and to rely increasingly upon high-tech, export-oriented businesses, particularly in the private sector. And this brings us very nicely, of course, to the video game sector. The video game sector is the kind of industry which you may have heard from politicians they love to support. Ed Vasey was here yesterday. I know he's very enthusiastic about the video game sector. So are his counterparts in the Liberal Democrats and in the Labour Party, because they know that our sector uh, is an industry of the future. Now, my organization, Tiger, the trade association representing the UK games industry, has been on a journey itself over the last two years. We've been trying to raise the media profile of the sector so that it's taken seriously in all forms of media discussion about the sector. We've been lobbying and working with parliamentarians in Westminster and in the Scottish Parliament, and we've been engaging directly with government. And we've been trying to make sure that we can help our members become ever more competitive. But above all, we've been trying to emphasize to the government and to policymakers that our sector is a serious sector and it deserves to be given proper consideration. So what I'd like to do this afternoon is just run through uh, some of the reasons why the sector should be taken seriously, highlight some of the challenges that we face, and indicate some of the solutions to those challenges. Now, we've argued to government that the games industry, the UK games industry, deserves to be taken seriously, partly because of its economic importance. The games sector in the UK contributes a billion pounds to UK GDP. It generates 400 million pounds in tax receipts to the Treasury. Very useful when you're running a sizable public deficit. The sector is also important because we provide jobs, employment. 28,000 people work in the sector, 9,000 work in game development. And although everyone plays an important part in the games industry, the people in development are particularly important, I think particularly from a political and economic point of view. Those 9,000 people who currently work in game development are extraordinarily well qualified compared to other sectors of the economy. We find in Tiger Studios, you'll find between 60 to 80% of staff will be qualified to degree level, and often you'll find people with MSCs and PhDs as well. It's a very well qualified workforce. I'm also pleased to say as well that game developers in the UK uh, spend a lot of money and spend a lot of time on training. Something like 91% of our membership provide training to their staff in one form or another. So it's a very well skilled workforce. And also, again, and this is very important for the UK economy, our sector is very export oriented. Our major market, our key market is the United States. The European Union market is very important too. Uh, but in a typical studio in the UK, you'll find that over 60% of turnover will be generated through exports. So again, it's just the kind of sector, just the kind of businesses that the UK government needs to support and wants to support. And our sector is also very R&D intensive. Uh, we found in our, most, in our most recent research that something like uh, two-fifths of all studios specifically have an R&D budget, and they spend approximately 20% of their turnover on R&D. So our sector is, our sector is high skills, it's export-oriented, uh, and it's contributing valuable money to the UK economy. But of course, that's not the only reason why the UK games industry is important. It's also important for educational reasons. And clearly, the conference that we're holding today and yesterday is a testament to that fact. Now, there's been research uh, conducted by Tiger and by other organizations that shows that something like a fifth of game developers in the country make games for educational or serious purposes, which is very encouraging. What's also encouraging, I think, is there are now a number of reports, uh, and our chairman will refer to one, of course, but there's a number of reports demonstrating that video games are very useful in terms of uh, promoting learning in the classroom. So we've had reports by Betta in 2001, uh, Department for Education and Skills in 2005, uh, Future Lab in 2006, and I think in 2008, uh, Teaching and Learning in Scotland brought out another report demonstrating that video games can be used to drive up standards in schools. Video games, of course, are also important in terms of improving workforce development. Now, the UK wants to position, position itself as a high-tech, knowledge-based economy. It's hard to do that when some firms in the UK don't provide any training at all. 
Uh, most recent research shows that something like a third of all small firms in the UK don't provide any training whatsoever. And I think there's a wonderful opportunity here for the serious game developers in the UK to provide uh, on-site serious game training in companies in the UK. Companies like Blitz Studios, companies like Caspian, companies like Digital 2.0, Pixel Learning, Playgen. These are the companies have a great opportunity, I think, to provide training in new forms to UK businesses in a range of industries. We'll talk about health, defense, fashion, other sectors of the economy too. So the great opportunities here, I think. In the games industry, we have said to government and to opposition spokesmen, we said the games industry is also important culturally. Now, television is a wonderful device. It allows you to be entertained by people in your living room who you would never let in through your front door. One of the good things about video games is it also provides a lovely form of entertainment. We have many different genres of games. Games can be played on many different platforms. And so it's no wonder that today we find that something like 73% of the UK population play video games in one form or another. Video games reflect our culture and they interact with other forms of media, like television, film, uh, and books. So video games are culturally important and they're being taken seriously increasingly by the media and by government. So the UK games industry is a success story. It's important economically, educationally, and culturally. But we can never afford to rest on our laurels. Let's never forget that today's peacock is tomorrow's feather duster. Let's never forget that an organization that is successful today can collapse tomorrow. And the UK games industry has faced challenges over the last few years. The most obvious challenge that we face has been in terms of tax. And the second key challenge we face has been in terms of education and skills. Now, with respect to tax, I'm sure all of you in this room are familiar with the issue that we faced. But the key point is this, that over the last few years, our competitors in Canada, in America, France, Australia, South Korea, China, have all provided tax relief for their video game developers or other forms of substantial government support. And that's put the UK games industry at a severe disadvantage. We may have had a skilled workforce, we may have had skilled management teams. We may have generated new IP, but we've had a cost disadvantage, and that's caused real damage to the UK games industry. Our research shows that since uh, 2008, 7% of the UK games industry workforce have lost their jobs. And we've also found that since July 2008, 15% of all games businesses in the UK went out of operation. And the UK has also slipped down the world lead tables from the third position in 2006 to fifth position last year. So the tax competition that we face has been a real issue for the UK games industry. Skills has been the other key challenge. Now our research showed that back in 2008, over two thirds of UK game developers suffered from skill shortages. And they would typically find it difficult to recruit good quality programmers, uh, designers, also project managers and experience management personnel. And that's caused problems, again, for the sector. Many developers have had to recruit skilled staff from overseas. Real Time Worlds, a very successful company, a very imaginative company up in Dundee, have had to recruit a quarter of their staff from outside of the United Kingdom. Game developers have experienced additional costs and delays to production because of skill shortages. And one of the issues, I think, has been the fact that there's been a decline in the proportion of people studying computer science in universities. It's been a drop of about 25% over the last four years. So game developers have faced an important problem here in terms of tax competition and in terms of suffering from skill shortages. However, there are always solutions to problems. And one of the things that Tiger, the trade association of the UK games industry, has been doing is to argue with policymakers that we need to redress the balance, that we need to introduce a tax break for games production. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, over the last two years, we've campaigned vigorously uh, and persistently for this tax measure. Last year, we issued 111 press releases, many about games tax relief, in order to raise coverage about the sector and to highlight the need for a games tax relief. We've met ministers, we've met opposition leaders, we have meetings with civil servants. Now, for a long period of time, nothing seemed to bear fruit. Uh, but Winston Churchill once said that uh, the route to success is the ability to go from one failure to another failure with no loss of enthusiasm. Now, Tiger has not lost any enthusiasm. We've campaigned and we've kept focused on games tax relief. And as you know, that last week in Alistair Darling's final budget, 
the government agreed to give us a tax, release, tax relief against production. And we're delighted by this measure. Uh, we think it's unalloyed and unadulterated good news for the UK games industry. As a benefit from this games tax relief, uh, you'd have to be uh, liable to pay UK corporation tax. You'd have to pass a cultural test. Uh, you could be uh, an education or serious-based games company, and you could be an entertainment-based company. But the reward is substantial. If you qualify for this release, relief, you could see 20 to 25 to 30% off the cost of your game production. So this will make a major difference for the UK games industry. Now, my namesake, Harold Wilson, a Labour Prime Minister, once said that uh, if you're going to give a, an economic forecast, you should give a statistic or a date, but you should never give both at the same time. Now, Tiger's been pretty enthusiastic about getting this tax relief, as you know. So today, again, we'll throw caution to the wind. And we predict that over a five-year period, the game's tax uh, relief would generate 3,500 graduate-level jobs, would lead to £457 million in investment in the sector, and would generate £450 million in tax receipts for the Treasury. So game's tax, re tax relief more than pays for itself. And we have to be careful, of course. One should never count one's chickens, although we've convinced the government. We also need to make sure the opposition parties are fully uh, supportive of this measure. But I really do believe that it will transform the UK games industry. It will create a level playing field for our industry and allow the development of both entertainment games and serious games to flourish. Now, people have said to me, you've got games tax relief underway. What's the next challenge? Now, clearly, improving skills, addressing skill shortages is a key issue. And we're working on a number of, fr of fronts here. In terms of policy proposals, we've argued with governments and the opposition parties that it's very important to uh, maintain investment in higher education. At the moment, UK higher education is a great success story. Fantastic track record in research, second biggest market for overseas students, good quality teaching. But we're very much living off past investments. The UK spends a proportion of GDP, only about 1% on higher education. Now again, our competitors uh, in South Korea, uh, Canada, the United States, they spend between 25 and 2.9% of national wealth on higher education. I don't believe that we can be a serious knowledge economy, and I don't believe higher education will be able to produce all the graduates the, Br the British economy needs and to provide a good experience for students unless we properly invest in higher education. So one of the points that we've been stressing to policymakers is the need to carry on investing in higher education despite the fact that we have a, a ballooning budget deficit and the economy has only just escaped from recession. We see it as an investment in the future and we're very keen to push forward this argument. We also believe that in order to encourage more people to study the sciences, in particular computer science and mathematics, we need to ensure that tuition fees are relatively cheaper in comparison to other undergraduate courses. We need to give people incentive to study these subjects, I think. And in mainstream schools, in mainstream education, uh, we've argued that it's important to give teachers an incentive to study or, uh, the best teachers who have got degrees in science and mathematics to go into teaching. It's very important to give them a financial incentive and to give them the freedom to teach and to use their professional expertise. But we've also argued that video games should be promoted as a career of choice in mainstream education, in public schools, in private schools, the whole panoply. STEM subjects are not easy subjects. I think people need to understand there's a potential career at the end of them, a potentially exciting career at the end of them. And video games, I think, can help play that part. It's very important that trade associations and business also takes responsibility for measures to improve its competitiveness and to enhance its ability to compete against its overseas rivals. So at Tiger, in addition to lobbying the government and raising the media profile, we've been working to strengthen the skills base in a number of ways. We have now about 20, 21 universities or colleges that are Tiger members. And we've been working to make sure that developers build links, build connections with higher education. It's very important to do that, I think, uh, to transfer knowledge, to encourage collaborative R&D ventures, and to improve and enhance courses. So that's one of the key things that we've been doing. We've also have been working with a distance learning company called Train to Game. Uh, we're acting as the awarding body for those courses that provide another route for people to either enter the games industry or proceed to further study and learning. And we're also offering and engaging with our members in the form of providing benchmarking, benchmarking information, best practice information to enable our developers to set standards and to make sure they're competing against the best companies in the world in the most effective fashion. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I did just see a member of the audience yawn. A yawn is a silent scream. 
It's a very important message to me that uh, I stick to time. So I'd just like to give you a brief recap of what I've been saying. The key thing to bear in mind is that the UK economy, it's generally agreed now, has to reorient itself away from relying very much on financial services and to refocus itself towards export businesses, R&D intensive businesses, and skill-based businesses. The video game sector is one such sector of the economy. Not the only one, but an important one. We believe our sector is important for economic, educational, and cultural reasons. We have faced challenges. Tax competition has been the key one. Skill deficiencies has been another. But we have shown the way ahead. It was a major coup for the games industry to be featured in last week's budget. It was a major achievement to have a games tax relief awarded to the games industry. It's everything to play for, and we intend to make sure we get these measures implemented in terms of tax and improving our skills base. So if I just leave you with one final thought, this final thought is this, that problems don't disappear by themselves. I found that uh, when you wake up next morning, they're around your bed, waiting to be dealt with. We're very keen to tackle the problems that face the industry. We're going to continue to raise the flag for game developers and the games industry in general. But we could do with your help. We could do with your help in terms of strengthening links between developers and higher education and education in general. We could do with your help in making sure that games tax relief serves the interests of serious game developers as well. And we could do with your help in terms of lobbying the government. So my commitment to everyone in the games industry is that Tiger will continue to drive the agenda forward, working for the sector, but I do hope you'll come along for the ride as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. Um, any questions? No? Yes. Um, I'm, I come from Malaysia, okay. Yeah. So um, how do you see um, this kind of phenomena where UK companies, game companies, start to have their branches in, in the third world? Yeah. Okay, so a number of UK game companies have started to set up branches overseas. They've started to outsource uh, activities uh, outside of the United Kingdom to other jurisdictions. It's worth bearing in mind that a lot of UK game companies also outsource within the UK to other businesses, but they do outsource, you're quite correct, to other, other jurisdictions as well. And this has partly been driven, of course, to take advantage of uh, uh, other countries' favourable economic circumstances, to take advantage of their tax breaks. I believe that UK, companies, UK games companies will continue to outsource activities, but I think the incentive to do so will be diminished. Now, some game companies say to me that they partly outsource not simply to take advantage of other countries' tax breaks and financial incentives, but also just to uh, take advantage of local talent, local expertise. So I think that will continue. But I do think that because games tax relief is now on the horizon, because there's a very strong chance to be implemented by 2011, I think the financial incentive will certainly be significantly diminished, uh, which I think is obviously good for UK companies. Uh, it's not necessarily a disaster for countries such as your own, because games is the Hollywood of the 21st century, Games are going to be produced in many other countries as well, so perhaps you're going to see more indigenous growth rather than growth being driven by uh, external investment from the UK to your country. Yeah. Hi, uh, Elan Ezekiel from BrainPop UK. Um, you asked for a lot of help from the education sector, and I'm just wondering whether Tiger are going to help education a bit more. Uh, we've seen some fantastic examples from practitioners using off-the-shelf games to inspire learners. Some wonderful s small examples, but the education, the uh, games de development houses and publishers don't seem to be doing very much to help the rest of uh, the profession to get the most out of this great technology. So what can you do for us? I wouldn't want you to think for a moment that it's not a two-way process. I mean, one of the reasons why, one of the things I did last year, actually, when joining Tiger, well, two years ago, actually, was to open Tiger membership up to universities and to ed educational institutions. That seemed a way to make sure that we could strengthen links between the two sides. Uh, I've worked in other sectors before, and people have said it's very important to build links between industry and academia, so that was something I wanted to do at Tiger. So one thing we are doing, we have a Tiger technology group, whereby we have meetings between developers and people from universities, educational establishments, to share technology, to share uh, information about uh, research activities they're undertaking. Uh, I mentioned in my talk that we 
work with universities and developers to put them in contact with each other to try to improve, uh, improve as an unfair word, to make courses even better than they already are. In terms of actually taking advantage of, of technology, one of the things that people have said to me in, in the games development sector is they've found it difficult to make the case sometimes for making educational type games. Uh, they've been under a lot of cost pressures themselves. I'm hoping the new economic environment which we're in you know, with games tax relief will help to ameliorate that problem. Could I just uh, follow on question? Uh, it's not so much about HE and FE, but the school sector where the, uh, the game developers of the future are being trained. And as you've seen from Too Simple and the other great tools today, there are teachers doing fantastic work preparing great talent for you guys in the future. Uh, wouldn't it be great to have all the uh, development houses sending out developers into schools to support this work and actually giving something back more in a more concrete way? That would be something that you could help us with. Mm. That's a good point. I mean, one of the things that uh, some development studios already do, actually, is to have, um, I suppose, in a way, you know, out outreach programs to schools and colleges. I mean, I know Blitz Studios uh, do that. They're obviously working. Uh, they're based in the West Midlands, as you know. They have a very extensive program of working with uh, schools and colleges. And it's pretty impressive, really, because I think, I mean, they might just be classified as a large company, but they're not that big, really. Most UK game developers are, of course, small or medium-sized enterprises. So there are always going to be pressures on uh, time and personnel. I think it's a good idea for game developers uh, to go out and link with schools. As you say, they are the industry of the future. But it's not even just simply that. I think there's a good case for business in general, and the games development sector in particular, to, as you put it, to put something back to, uh, to schools and education. Uh, it's part of corporate social responsibility in a way. So quite apart from any sort of economic advantage that you may get, and it may actually not be that great, I think actually it's an important task to do, an important responsibility on the part of business to do that. Tiger itself is actually quite a, a small organization. Uh, we haven't got that many members of staff to go out and do such talks. Uh, although I'd be very happy to turn up to, uh, you know, a mass gathering of students if, uh, to achieve a sort of critical mass and get a proper effect, as it were. But, you know, Tiger, the games development sector are very keen to work with schools and colleges, uh, and we're going to carry on doing so. Thank you. Good. Thanks, Richard. Thank you. Um, the topic of